The meat industry knows that they can't meet the demand of the people. And if the demand for meat is going to double by 2050, there is just no method of production that they have at their disposal now that would satisfy that hunger for meat. There just isn't. You are the film director of Meet the Future, which has been released this year, 2020. Our release in Canada was in May of this okay. year, right, right in the middle of the lockdown of COVID. Uh, we had a very high profile Canadian national mm -hmm. release. Mm -hmm. And now the film is on the film festival circuit around the globe. Mm -hmm. And we're still waiting um, to see when our official release right. uh, t to the world will be. Listeners can follow us to uh, keep, keep up to date on, on those release dates. Meet the Future is a documentary that is about the birth of the cell-based meat industry, um, otherwise known as cultivated meat or clean meat or cell-cultured meat. There's all these different terms to describe what it is because everyone refers to it a little bit differently. But the film really chronicles uh, the birth of that industry in America through the eyes of pioneers and scientists and food innovators and activist game changers. We followed the story from 2016 to 2019, predominantly through the lens of a small startup company called Memphis Meats. Yes. out of California. And that was really a device, like a filmmaking decision of mine to use that company yes. and that story, the story of the acceleration of that company as a way of representing all the other companies around the world that are popping up. There's, there's almost 80 companies now around the globe. Oh, 80 companies. I was thinking about two or three or four. We met Mark Post a few years ago and he, mm -hmm. he, he told us about the development of this uh, culture of meat. And I think uh, Memphis Meats is an interesting uh, microcosm because they're the first uh, official, I guess, company in the world that dedicated themselves to the commercialization mm -hmm. of this. I mean, everyone is in their research and development Mm -hmm. mode, because this is not yet available for people. But really, it's the innovation of producing real meat mm -hmm. from animal cells without the need to breed, raise, and, and slaughter billions, trillions of animals, mm -hmm. because, you know, the world largely still eats meat. Yes. Um, and so this could be a very viable, very revolutionary food innovation that could change the world for animals, Absolutely. for the environment, for f human health. Uh, for so many reasons. That's why I decided to focus on it, because mm -hmm. I care about all those issues. What was the most uh, exciting thing that happened during the, the shooting? What um, surprised you the most? I think what surprised me the most is how is the acceleration of it. Because when mm -hmm. we started filming in 2016, uh, they had just literally moved into their first research facility. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was this teeny tiny team of of people, you know, I think there were five people at the time that were, you know, really committed and passionate. But of course, they were taking huge risks. And Uma Valetti, the mm -hmm. CEO and co-founder of Memphis Meats, yes. the film is really centered around him because then that gives the film a really human anchor point. And he's a really interesting person. The film, in a way, charts his rise in prominence as a pioneer, as a CEO. Because uh, to answer your question, I think the most surprising thing that happened is that, you know, a year later, after filming, suddenly Richard Branson, Bill Gates, and two of the largest meat companies in the world, Cargill and Tyson, mm -hmm. are investing in his company. And that sent a message to the world mm -hmm. that this is not just a big idea, but it's a big idea whose time has come. And that it's also not so much of a concept that is utopian or in the, in mm -hmm. the far off it's not science fiction. It's actually mm -hmm. happening. It's happening now. And it really could be in 
supermarkets and restaurants within the next few years. In terms of technical breakthroughs that allowed us to do what we did over the last year, we had a few substantial isolated breakthroughs. So uh, one of the things that was more relevant to the poultry is um, starting to have texture. Because with the meatball, there was texture, but not the types of texture we had with uh, poultry, where we could have very clearly fibers that you could see in there. Fibrosity starting to have three-dimensional nature to the meat that we are producing. Do you think that these big investments that have arrived very quickly are due also to the interest that you as a filmmaker put on this uh, project? When I remember 2016 and, and trying to get financed by the documentary film industry for this project, mm -hmm. it was so hard. In fact, we didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. But in 2017, 2018, that's when this started to become more of a mainstream discussion and something that people were not so afraid of, but actually leaning into and, and interested in. And now, 2020, I think there's far more interest in this topic because I think that people are starting to understand the need for solutions and that the conventional meat industry mm -hmm. is failing in every possible way. People that care about animals mm -hmm. have been raising red flags around this for a very long time. People that care about climate change, about biodiversity, mm -hmm. about our ecosystems, our water, about land use, all these huge, enormous environmental concerns. People are starting to make those links directly mm -hmm. to industrial animal agriculture as being a, a culprit. It's exciting to experience that now mm -hmm. and more and more increasingly. Then also from a global health pandemic perspective, the links being made to zoonoses, zoonotic mm -hmm. disease, Yes. is when bacteria, virus, is passed from animals to humans. Mm -hmm. And we, we see that in wet markets, we see that in industrial farming, um, where animals are packed together and it's very unsanitary. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, we can trace this all through our history, you know, going back to the Spanish influenza, the flu, mm -hmm. uh, that wiped out millions of people in the world. And COVID-19, the coronavirus, is also a zoonotic disease. So the concept, the advent of real meat being grown outside of an animal mm -hmm. from animal cells in a clean, sterile environment mm -hmm. is something that um, I think people are catching on to and looking at as a potential way of preventing enormous health risks as well as the moral underpinnings. There's just so many reasons why we should be paying attention to this as a potential solution. I keep using the word potential yeah. um, because it doesn't exist yet. And so it would be dangerous to talk about this in terms that are completely tangible and completely um, worked out. They're still in research and development, but what's exciting and what we were able to chronicle and chart and witness mm -hmm through our cameras and through being on the ground with these amazing, interesting people is that over three and a half years, we were able to actually capture an arc, mm -hmm. a, na a natural dramatic arc of a story about the birth of this industry. Traditionally in tissue culture, um, one of the elements of the food that you're giving the cells is fetal bovine serum. Um, if you start with fetal calf serum, essentially you're starting with this perfect, rich broth of awesome stuff that is designed to make things grow and thrive. But one of the scientific goals of the company right now is to eliminate any animal-derived product from a process as soon as possible. Um, we want to separate the animal from meat making. Did you consider <laughs> also Maybe I'm going to make a movie on the vegetable meats and uh, the increase yeah. you know, on the market of this kind of uh, substitute yes. of the meat. That film is being made. That film has already been made. There's other people making those films. Like Game Changers was also yes. be being made at the same time as Meet the Future, and it was released earlier. And there's other films coming out, and there's other films that have come out about that. Also, as a filmmaker, I think it was really exciting to be able to have exclusive access mm -hmm. and to film 
something that has not, not been filmed in the way that we've been able to have access and film it. Basically making that decision to say, no, this is our focus for the yes. film. We're focusing on this one thing, which is huge and complex. But to be able to say, okay, we're not focusing on the, uh, the, the whole alternative protein sector. Yes. We're not focusing on plant-based meat plus cell-based meat. Mm -hmm. That makes it almost too broad, although that could be an amazing mm -hmm. series that I'm really interested in uh, mm -hmm. in creating, for sure. Okay, so this doesn't mean that you consider vegetable meat something not uh, interesting at all? No, no. I mean, uh, first of all, I'm vegan, so I don't eat meat. Mm -hmm. um, and a huge motivation for me behind making Meet the Future yes. is because I, I care about all these issues in terms of my own ethics, in terms of my own moral compass. I was vegetarian for the longest time, and mm -hmm. then I decided to make The Ghosts in Our Machine. You can see the poster behind me. That's my mm -hmm. 2013 documentary that um, some of your listeners, viewers may have seen, yes. because it had a lot of global exposure, and it continues to be used as a, as a tool for mm -hmm. consciousness raising. It's the story of Joanne MacArthur, who's an animal rights photographer. Mm -hmm. And we follow her over the course of time as she photographs animals within the food industry, within other industries. So that was my first animal rights film. And that's when I went vegan. Mm -hmm. is, it, so, is it already in, uh, translated into Italian? Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, yeah, this is interesting. That's when I went vegan making mm -hmm. that film. And so after I made that film, it was really important to me to focus on something that was about a solution. I'm an idealist, but I'm also a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. I, I see myself equally as both. Yes, to answer your question, I believe, of course, in plant-based meat as a major alternative, mm -hmm. as a major solution to the problem. But I also am aware that 90% of the world mm. eats meat and mm -hmm. that there's all kinds of predictions about economies yes. like India, like China, like Brazil and places like that. And with population growth, mm. that that meat consumption will be on the rise. There's other predictions that in sort of more high income countries mm -hmm. that meat consumption will be halved mm -hmm. uh, by 2030. So we're looking at, you know, because of effective um, advocacy yes. issues, yes. Um, you know, we could be looking at um, the reduction of meat big time mm. as well. We can eliminate industrial animal agriculture um, in the next 20 to 30 years. The best way to do that, it's markets, it's food technology, it's creating products that people actually want to buy that they can afford and that they can find. I think your film is going to give, a, in the right way, an explanation that the vegan movement is not going to be enough. At the speed that it is rising, it's not going to change the world before a couple of centuries. So we have to uh, adopt another solution. And the one you are explaining very well in the movie it is a solution. Do you have the feeling that this uh, culture of meat uh, is going to be safe in the future or are we going to meet other problems concerning to, for example, pollution because of this new unknown industry coming in? I love the fact that it's been verified through research and development that greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. would be heavily reduced. In fact, they don't anticipate having a footprint in that area whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to CO2 emissions, uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about that. Mm -hmm. But see, this industry will need to, but they also want to dovetail with the green economy, with wind, solar energies, ways of uh, using water for recapture and innovative ways of using water. If you take the green economy on one hand and, and all of the, uh, the green energy sector that's emerging around mm -hmm. the globe and that needs to accelerate and be amplified in a very big way moving forward. And then if you take cultured meat as an emerging industry as well, that also needs to accelerate and be amplified. And well, first of all, it needs to be regulated. It's not regulated yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll get back to that question in a moment. Yes. But on the environmental side, if you take those two industries 
and they work together, mm -hmm. then CO CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions mm -hmm. and all those damaging impacts. I mean, I'm not an expert in that, but mm -hmm. it seems to be from the literature that I've that I've been reading and the discussions that I've witnessed that that is a major focus of this industry is that they want to have a small environmental footprint. You asked about safety of this new product for people's health. And I don't know, I, again, I'm, I'm not an expert on any of this. I, I consider myself as a documentary filmmaker, kind of a small E expert, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. So yes. because, I, because I have had that privilege of witnessing this story unfold, I wasn't able to have access to everything I would have liked to have mm -hmm. had access to. You know, there were a lot of things that these companies and Memphis Meats are guarding as intellectual mm -hmm. property, which makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, it doesn't even exist in the world yet for people. But one of the exciting parts of the story that's in the film mm -hmm. was being able to be at the United States Department of Agriculture and mm -hmm. to film the very first historic day that so many diverse people came together in that space in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. to talk about their concerns and to talk about their hopes and dreams mm -hmm. for this and to talk about all the pressing reasons why this is a potential, like, massive solution. But also ranchers and farmers were there to talk about their major concerns and to, you know, push back on certain things. So mm. that provides some dramatic tension in the film. It also gives us that opportunity of having diverse voices on mm -hmm. this topic. But it also shows that the big food regulation agencies in the U.S., that's the FDA and the USDA, mm -hmm. are working together and they mm -hmm. want America to move as quickly as possible mm -hmm. so that this can be on the market. So, you know, they're not going to green light something to be mm -hmm. on the market unless it goes through a whole bunch of trials and you know the research behind this is mm -hmm. really essential but you know we see through the story of Memphis Meats that they've forged those relationships and and that regulation story from a food perspective mm -hmm. is really is really interesting i liked uh, very much that part of the movie when the the two parts are meeting and discussing uh, to each other. I thought it was impossible. So that, that's really a miracle. And uh, it's good that you have shown. Okay, Liz, I thank you very much for being on Veggie Channel. It was very mm -hmm. kind. I hope your movie arrives very soon in Italy. Maybe one day we will meet uh, in Rio. But in the meantime, let's raise lots of awareness in Italy about this mm -hmm. project so that um, we can release it there. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. See you soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Take Bye. care. Bye. Take care.